All right, good, um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, and welcome to the second session of our graduate student presentations for the uh, Peanut Innovation Lab. Uh, it's uh, great to see everybody joining uh, today's presentations. We had an excellent um, 10 presentations a week ago. Uh, and we look forward to an equally exciting uh, presentations today. We have eight lined up to speak to us this morning. As I said uh, a week ago, our, our reason for doing this really grew out of what we used, what we've done in several of our annual meetings where we would have students make short presentations and present posters to kind of update us on their exciting research projects that they were undertaking and, and as well give an opportunity for, for those who were attending those meetings to provide feedback, uh, et cetera. And of course, with the COVID-19 restrictions, we weren't able to have our annual meeting uh, about a month or so ago in person, but we did do it virtually. We had a few students able to present during that time, uh, but because of our time limitations, et cetera, we weren't able to have as many students as we would like. And, and the feedback we got from almost everyone was they really would appreciate uh, hearing about all the students. And we have uh, over 35 students that are actually conducting research under the peanut, currently under the peanut innovation lab. So we reached out to, to all the students and, and uh, they were equally excited about the opportunity. Uh, and so we've organized these presentations over the course of four days. Our first that was last week. Today, we have one tomorrow. I see on our slide that somehow we, well, I see, okay, now I see what you did. You removed the 12th from the, from the title. So we had one a week ago. We have one today, tomorrow morning, and then one a week from today for the last uh, of the sessions. So over those four days, I think we're going to hear from almost all of our students uh, and get a chance to learn of the exciting research projects that they're undertaking as part of the, the program here with the Peanut Innovation Lab. Maybe we can go to the next slide. Just to remind before we get started this morning uh, that we are recording these sessions. You may have already seen that uh, the recordings from Last week's presentations are available on YouTube. And uh, uh, if you missed that email, uh, please uh, let Kristen or us know and we'll be happy to make sure you, you have the link to, to watch those recordings. Uh, for just making sure that we maximize the use of, of our bandwidth, uh, unless you're the speaker, uh, please make sure that your microphone is muted and your video is off. We um, are using a Zoom meeting format rather than a webinar type format. So everyone can see and, and talk on the, on the Zoom call. Uh, once the speaker has finished their presentation, hopefully we'll have a few minutes for questions and, and comments. Uh, if you want to uh, submit those during the presentation, feel free to do so in the chat window. And I'll do make sure that I uh, ask those to the speaker, but we'll also have a chance uh, for anyone who would like to turn on their microphone and, and video and ask the person uh, a question as well. So I think without uh, further ado, we'll get started this morning so that we'll stay as close to time as we can. And our first presenter this morning is going to be Ruth Marimbe, uh, who is doing a master's degree at Makerere University in Uganda. And Martha is going to be speaking about using photo voice to enhance the post harvest quality and safety of peanuts uh, in uh, a couple of districts in Uganda. We look forward to your presentation, Ruth. Thank you very much, Dave. I'm really very excited to talk to you. Um, okay. 
Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, I'm Rizma Tamirembe. Um, uh, after some adjustments in my project, um, my title somehow changed, and I'm going. My research is using photo voice to enhance for service quality and safety of peanuts, and I'm using a case for youth in rural and rural districts. Um, my academic supervisors, I'm working with Professor Achiba Wakaya, he's my lecturer here at Makari University, and also Dr. Dennis Male, also a lecturer at Makari University. Then Professor Kari, who is, uh, who, who is a, a, a professor at the University of Tennessee in the US. Next. Um, just to talk a brief, uh, to talk briefly about photo voice, it's a, co a community participatory research approach whereby we give participants funds uh, based on a specific theme we want them to investigate about. Uh, we we train them uh, about about using the funds and everything, and then after give them the consent forms which they use. To take the so that they can be authorized to take photos of individuals. Then after they collect photos for a specific period of time, then they come back together in a group focus group discussion. Then we describe the the pictures and they really give us a, some more information about what they the background of the pictures they took. Next. Um, just also to talk about peanuts, they are mainly consumed in Uganda, but one key thing in a food science aspect is they are susceptible for fungal and aflatoxin contamination. And due to this, uh, many of the Ugandan consumers are, uh, are exposed to such high levels of aflatoxin. And many studies have really shown the the occurrence of aflatoxins and everything and, and the food safety bit of peanuts which is still lacking in Uganda. Next. Now uh, for the photo voice, the photo voice methodology has really been applied in many areas but then it has not been applied in agriculture value chains. So we seek to use uh, the photo voice method in assessing food quality and safety of peanuts post harvest. Next. Uh, my general objective is I'm evaluating the applicability of photo voice in assessing food quality and safety post harvest. And then to be specific, my specific objectives are assessing the feasibility of the method in assessing food quality, peanut quality and safety post harvest. Then after that, I'm evaluating the effectiveness of using photo voice as a method of improving food surface quality and safety. My third objective, uh, now since photo voice is mainly subjective, now we want to attach an objective perspective where we analyze samples which are from the pictures which have been captured by photo voice. Next. Uh, my research questions um, uh, I went, uh, which I'm going to answer uh, mainly is photo voice a feasible method for evaluating food quality and safety and whether photo voice is an effective method in assessing quality and safety of peanuts and how the photo voice aspect, the photo voice aspects which are, the food quality and safety aspects which have been captured by photo voice, how they compare with the laboratory analysis which are mainly objective. Now um, I will use study youth from Noya and Torre districts, both male and female, 15 from each district, and each will, all of them will be recruited for that study. Now, they will be given consent forms prior to enrollment into the study, and then also during the the photo taking, they will be give, giving the subjects 
uh, consent forms so that they can really give us the authorization to take their pictures. Then also after taking the photos, they have to give us consent uh, in publishing and using the photos they have taken. So that is the use of the consent form mainly for ethical considerations in the study. Next. Uh, just to take you through the photo waste procedure, we will train the youth in the photo waste method. Then after they will take the photos for a full year to cover the two seasons of the peanuts. Then after we shall conduct focus group discussions where they will be discussing the photos uh, uh, following the show technique of discussion. Then after we shall select the photos which are mainly important for the food quality and safety aspect. Then after we shall summarize and then analyze using a specific software. Next. Uh, just to get up our objective three, we shall be, uh, shall be doing the laboratory analysis of quality and safety. That is acid value, peroxide and crude fat, that is for the quality aspect. Then the microbial and the aflatoxin analysis for the safety aspect of the peanuts. Next, uh, just to analyze the data, the interpretation from photo voice, we shall give, I will be using the actual sky version and then the Excel statistical software for the quantitative data of, obtained from the battery analysis. Next, uh, just to my work plan, I, I wanted to start with August for my data collection. Hopefully, <laughs> I can really start. Then uh, the analysis, I, I just want to finish all this thing in 2021, that is June. Next. Uh, yeah, this is a brief budget about my research. And just, I, I think I'll just go to the field expenses. I incorporated in something about COVID-19 just to help out in the field expenses, like for example, sanitizers, the temperature guns, um, whatever, just to, to be COVID or, or uh, alert. Yeah, but the rest will be in the laboratory analysis. Next. Uh, about my progress, I'm a registered Macquarie student. I had a training with Professor Curry that was back then in 2019. I also made the youth last year, 2019. Then early this year, I went uh, for a gender awareness workshop with Great here in Kampala, Uganda. And also um, this June during the lockdown, I received the uh, research material that is the laptop which I'm using right now, and also the phone which we'll be using for the photo waste study. Then also I had a peanut tour at Serere, thanks to Dr. Okello. Thank you very much, it was really informative. Then I also defended my proposal in July and it was really approved. Um, I got my, my supervisors, that is Professor Kilo Fire and Dr. Dennis, we are also confirmed. So I'm working with two professors right now. Next. Um, the challenge I'm facing is my coursework is not yet, it's still pending. This is because the university was closed due to COVID-19. And also due to the closure and the lockdown, Dr. Kara is, is also yet to travel to Uganda so that we can catch up with the agenda for the, for the project. And also the RRB, R, IRB approvals have not yet been tackled about the study. Yeah, thank you very much. That will be my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Very. I think um, we are have a few minutes now for any kind of questions or comments uh, regarding Ruth's presentation. Ruth is obviously at the very beginning of her her research. So uh, as you can see, it's a proposal for what she hopes to be able to do. I guess while people are thinking about any questions, uh, Ruth, one for me, um, I mean, clearly, 
your project's going to depend on your ability to go to the field, meet with the youth, interact with them. And as you mentioned, your challenges right now, I think that's very restricted. Uh, do you have any timeline in mind when you think you might be able to, to conduct those? I know you said you would like to get started this month, but I'm not sure of the latest situation in Uganda and with, uh, but uh, what do you think will be the time in which you'd be able to go out to the villages? You need to unmute, please, unless I can do that for you. Okay, right now travel, people can travel um, to the villages, maybe when the, they, they put us under lockdown again, but right now travel, traveling to the villages is ongoing. So I can really access my participants if I'm to start right away. With my, with my research. Okay. And, and also, um, after the first meeting, we shall be giving these people funds. So accessibility to them will be now more, more polished because now they will be, we shall be having platforms where you can discuss the photos without even me going to the villages. That is if lockdown is if we are under lockdown again. So I will be communicating with the youth via, via social media, via so social media platforms in case I cannot access them in the villages. All right, good. Sir. Uh, Jessica asked a question kind of along following up on on the one I just asked is it, it sounds mm -hmm. like you still have to complete some of your coursework as well yeah and so that's going to be going on simultaneously with the field work is that going to create any additional challenges uh, right now I have uh, uh, I have an advantage because now the university we are not having lectures the universities under lockdown, no lectures are going are taking place, but then the projects are going on. So right now I can I can be working on my research. Then when the university op reopens, I can still do it simultaneously. Once in a month, go to the villages and come back. All right. Yeah. I agree that ability to do things virtually may help work in your favor to be able to, to, to yes. do work. To work in your favor. Any other questions for Ruth this morning? You, you may have you may have answered this. I'm not sure. How are the participants being selected? How are you choosing and in what areas are the, I think it's 30? Mm, yes. Along the value chain, how, how are you selecting them? Okay, the, uh, my, uh, my entry point was uh, organizations which are already dealing with peanut growing in the villages. For example, uh, NGOs, peop, uh, project peop, uh, farmers who are already, like for example, in Tororo, uh, I, I, the, there is uh, this collect, this umbrella of farmers. So uh, I, I went, we went there and we interfaced with the youth farmers in, such, in that organization. And then mainly we are going to use stratified sampling whereby we want to incorporate uh, youth from 20 to 29 years, both male and female in both districts. So it will be more of stratified, stratified sampling, random sampling. But then we are working with farmers who are already engaged in with other organizations in those districts. Thank you.
One, one last question from you, from me, Ruth. Um, I know that uh, we'll hear from Daisy, I believe, on the 26th on her project. She's a fellow grad student on, on this. Will the yeah. youth be the same in both of your projects? Are you selecting different youth for your project and she will have a different set of participants? No, we're using the same youth. So you will be looking more at the quality and she'll be looking at, at the economic yeah. component. Okay. We are going to see how we're going to play the, the cards very well so that everyone gets results. Okay, all right, very good. <clears throat> looking, I don't see any more questions on the chat. So thank you very much, Ruth, and, and good luck. And I hope uh, you are able to get out to the field and, and everything will go well for this coming cycle. Thank, thank you, you very Bill. much for your presentation. Welcome. So we'd like to now move on to our next speaker, Aminu Muta who is a master's student uh, studying with Ikrasat in Niger. Um, and Aminu's talk is going to be about the identification of biochemical and physiological traits for the peanut seed coat resistance to a flavus colonization and aflatoxin contamination. Aminu, we look forward to your presentation. Aminu, can you unmute yourself? Hopefully you're still on. I see you're... Next. Connection. Give us one moment. I'm a new. Can you unmute yourself, please? We just heard you say next. So if you are available, please unmute your audio and we will begin your presentation. If you are needing assistance, feel free to let me know.
Are you ready to Yes. Yes. Okay. Back. Back. I'm ready. Yes. I'm ready. We can hear you. Can you mute your computer? I believe you're calling in and it's picking up the sound twice. Okay. Allison, that's Hannah Koi. We are on Aminu Muta. <laughs> I'm going to move that. You are the presenter at the moment. I see you're now unmuted. If you okay. are ready, please begin. Yes. I'm ready. I'm ready now. Okay. My name is Aminu Mama Nutari. I'm here. Thank you very much to this opportunity to me for presenting my work advancement on identification of biochemical and physiological threats for peanut silicone resistance to Aspergillus flavors colonization and aflatoxin contamination. Next. Finat is a second important cash crop in Niger, which produces in the five regions of eight of the eight regions of the country. It is called human cough because a majority of producers and the processors are women. Are women. In addition to, to use it in livestock and poultry, peanut seed and other products are consumed by all of the rural and urban people. A Niger annual production is 454 tons. A finite yield is uh, low compared to the leading producers in the West African country, Senegal and Nigeria. In West Africa area of peanut production, aflatoxins are the most potent mycotoxins which cause serious health hazards to consumers of peanut and its products. This led to less peanut export from Niger. To provide it economic and health benefits to Niger, it is imperative to improve peanut resistance to prey and first harvest of flavors colonization and aflatoxin contamination. Dot occurring almost each year in Niger. If the main factor increasing aflatoxin contamination in the peanut. The finite line with dot tolerance stress generally showed lower level of free harvest of latoxin contamination, indicating that they may possess some degree of resistance to aflatoxin contamination using a combination of those three and the biochemical threats should lead to identification of lines with dual tolerance and aflatoxin contamination. Next. The aim of the work is to assess peanut line under field conditions for identifying biochemical and physiological threats contributing to prey and post-harvest resistance to aflatoxin contamination. 
The objectives of this work are the first one is to evaluate peanut lines for terminal root tolerance and identify a tolerance associated trace. Second one is to identify specific biochemical markers associated to a flavors resistance and seed coat in seed coat. The last one is to investigate correlation between drought tolerance and resistance to aflatoxin contamination in elite line of peanuts. Next. Assessment of peanut line for terminal dot under feed condition. Two feed experiments was conducted in 1929 rainy seasons and 2020 off seasons. The experiment design was a randomized complete block design with four replication and two factor. Water regime at two levels, well watered and water stress imposed at 60 days after sowing and 25 lines for 99 and 50 lines for 2020. This factor, this picture uh, presents uh, a plant's evolution under well water treatment and uh, water stress treatments. Next. Measurements. Phenological parameters was measured, such as that of 50% flowering, that of maturity, and that of harvest. Physiological parameters was measured, such as leaf area. Leaf area measured with leaf area meter LIE, LIE, 300, 3,300. Leaf area index was measured with LAI 2000. Specific leaf area is a ratio, uh, a ratio of uh, leaf area to leaf weight. Chlorophyll contents was measured with span. Yield and its components was determined after harvest. Holm weight, wood weight, wood yield, sand seed weight, and harvest index. Seed colonization test. The, the intact seed was sterilized in ethanol, in ethanol 65% and, uh, and uh, rinsed in uh, distilled water and put in the petri dish with blotter paper and uh, in the blotter paper and uh, each petri dish contained 10 seeds. And each lines is represented by four petri dish and, and uh, incubated in the dark at 25 degrees for eight days and watered by two millimeters in two days. After the rating scale method was used to uh, was used to situate the uh, severity of colonization and uh, uh, incidence, uh, colonization incidence was measured by this formula. Number of seed of seed divided of total seed multiplied for 100. Biochemical parameter the test tannin silico uh, tannin color determination. We, we use a seed, a intact seed coat was put it in water distilled for five minutes. Next. The 
This result is for 1999 trial. This, this figure presents a, a variation of pulp yield under water, well water, and, uh, and water stress, stress treatment. Due stress reduced up to 27% whole yield. From varied, some lines, some lines produce high whole yield under due stress treatment, like ICG 311G11, and some other produces low whole yield under, under uh, water stress treatment, ICG. 12, 2, 3, 5. Next. Physiological parameters specific leaf area. This factor presents a variation of specific leaf area under water stress treatment and well water treatment. It showed a static, a statical significant, significant difference among the lines and, and between a water to water regime. To water regime. Do stress reduce it, reduce it up to 25% specific leaf area. However, high specific leaf area was shown by was produced by some lines such as ICG ICG 15 3 Eight zero G ones and the low specific area was produced under stress stress condition like flare eleven IDC one six three. Next, this figure presents a full yield variation of lines under two water regime. Stress, uh, it is uh, it showing a statical significant difference among, among the lines. Some, some lines showed a high food production under water stress condition and other showing low food production under water stress conditions. Next. According to the agrophysiological parameters and yield component, the most tolerance line for, for 29 experiments are ICG 6, 8, uh, 13, ICG 12, 9, 8, 8, etc. Data analyze of 2020 of of season trial are in processing. Next. This figure present a representative petri dish of line tested. We have the three most resistance line to, to fingal colonization. It presented a low seed surface colonization. It is considered, it's considered as the more resistance to fungal colonization than online tested, the happening color. The three susceptible lines are colonized by uh, up to 
50% seed surface colonized are more susceptible to fungal colonization than online testing. They have dark and red color. Next. The three more susceptible lines to, uh, to fungal colonization and the three uh, more resistance line for, for fungal colonization were used, were introduced in a solution. The susceptible line solution to seed coat color and the resistant line solution did not color change. The resistance line like uh, 55437 ICG 12 8 content a condensed tannin. tannin. The susceptible lines like ICG 12235 content hydrolyzed tannin according to to Gerwig. 19, 1996. Next. Next. Our future work are quantifying seed infection and the free harvest of toxin with ELISA method and field screening for resistance to a flavor seed infection and the free harvest of toxin contamination and seed coat biochemical analysis. Some work were not did because we didn't do the training as suitable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aminu. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry for the bit of the technical difficulties, but I'm glad that we were able to sort those out and, and you were able to make your presentation. Uh, the floor is, is open for any questions that anyone might have at this time. Remember you can submit them by chat or if you would like just uh, turn on your microphone. I have one question. Please. I, mean, uh, I wasn't able to quite look at the correlations between the lines that you had selected or has dropped. The sound is bad. The sound. You turn off my video. The sound is bad. Can you write? Can you hear me better now? A question by, by test message. Let me do that. Maybe if you can see that. And then you come up and put it in the middle. Good if you wish. Yeah, I'm going to Okay, I typed my question, Aminu, if, if you can read that. Relates to how, how did you define, how do you define a drought tolerant line between the two different conditions of well watered and water stress? Is it that they yield very well under well water or is there a, there's only a small difference between well water and water stressed conditions? Always you. 
Maybe we have <clears throat> am I still muted? I can't tell. Yeah. Maybe we have lost him. Uh, I'll, well, I can follow up with Aminu later and, and he can answer the question once he gets a chance to read the chat and all. So I think we're going to move on just and in, in just make sure that we keep on schedule. So thanks Aminu for the presentation and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, the results from this year's trial as well. Very, very good work, very important. So our, our next hi, presenter. Hi, Dave. Hello, is this Hamidou? Hi, Dave, how are you? All right, Paulo how are you? Yeah, so the student made their, their, their presentation, so I left them to, to try to do it in, um, in English in order to, to, to start the training on that. <laughs> Yeah, when they will be reaching the U.S., then it will be uh, interesting for them. All right, very good, Paulo. So if, yes. Yeah, if everyone has a question, he can send a message, and then we, we try to, to respond. Okay, very good, Paulo. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. All right, so our, our next speaker is going to be Emmanuel C., uh, who's doing a master's uh, at the University of Ghana. And Emmanuel is going to be presenting about the field phenotyping of biotic and abiotic stresses uh, in Ghana. So over to you, Emmanuel. We look forward to your presentation. Good morning. And thank you for the opportunity given me to discuss with you field phenotyping of biotic and abiotic stress and peanut for increased genetic gains in Ghana. I am doing Enfield Plant Breeding and Genetics, University of Ghana. Next. Next, please. I have Professor Kwayo Ufori and Dr. Ajimai Dankwa as my university advisors, with Dr. Richard Otin Frimpon as my research advisor, and Dr. Maria Baluta as project PI. Next. Next, please. And this is going to be the order of my presentation. Background, justification, hypothesis and objectives, materials and methods, results, plan activities, and some references. Yes. As we speak today, over 800 million people in the developing countries like Ghana are chronically hungry. About 2 billion are deficient in micronutrients. Malnourishment results to impairments in both physical and mental development, infectious diseases, and deaths of 2.6 million children. Next. And so, with that problem of malnourishment, together with increased in population, which is to reach 9 billion by 2050, it means production of peanut, which is an important crop, especially when it comes to Ghana, needs to increase so that the demand that are with for us in the future can be met. Here is the case, production is challenged as of now due to climatic conditions and also alterations in land use. And so we have to look for ways that we can use to, pro to produce more of granules with this shrinkage line that we, land size that we have currently. And so doing so need significant transformation in food production. Yes. So like I said, when you come to Northern Ghana, peanut is an important crop in the sense that it meets the requirement of protein for the diet of the people, which is made of cereal. With the high protein content and oil content, and as well as the other macronutrients that peanut possess, it's able to meet this nutrient requirement of the diet. It also provides higher earnings when you come to the farming communities. And so it is also an important crop that when its production is increased, it serves to reduce poverty, which is highly in northern Ghana. Next.
And so with the challenges like droughts and diseases that prevent the maximization of the production, it means that we have to find ways to be able to produce to meet the demand in the midst of these challenges. And like I said earlier, we can only do this through <coughs> genetic gains because now our land size is reducing. And so which means as the population increases, we're not going to get that vast land to produce. We have to be looking at ways by which we can increase production in the small land size that we have. And that can only be done when we increase genetic gains in peanut production. Next. And so one way of increasing genetic gain is selection. Well, when you are efficient in selecting good materials. And so the manual ways of selection is, is somehow limited in the sense that it's sometimes inefficient. And so using sensors to phenotype is a good way to go in the sense that they provide multi-trade valuations with automatic measurements. They also upgrade in measurement and also offers direct storage of data. This saves time significantly and also offers non disruptive measurement. Next. And so it is hypothesized that application of sensors for phenotyping is more accurate than manual phenotyping methods. Next. So the general objective of the study is to explore the effectiveness of using sensors as phenotyping tools to increase peanut genetic gains in Ghana. Yes. And so the specific objectives are to determine the effectiveness of applying sensors as phenotyping tools for yield estimation, to determine the efficiency of using sensors as phenotyping tools to estimate peanut diseases and compare the results with manual measurement. And the third one is to determine the efficiency of using sensors as phenotyping tools to estimate drought tolerance in peanuts. And so to achieve this, two experiments have been established in this main season. The first one consists of 10 genotypes from the peanut breeding programs of SARI. And these genotypes are being used as training population. And we also have a second experiment that contains 192 short duration genotypes that are collected from the Afri African germplasm for as a validation population. Next. And so for experiment one, the experiment is conducted using the design two by five alpha lattice design, which is repeated four times as training population. And so we are talking about 40 data points here. And I've used lattice design in the sense that with the way fields are prepared in Ghana, a lot of variations okay. And so even though the genotypes you can use RCBD, I decide to use alpha lattice to reduce variation within plots. Each plot contains four rows of two meter long with a spacing of 0.4 meters between rows and 0.1 meter between plants. We took data using RGB. Images were taken, and these images taken. We use the brick piece Fiji to extract the RGB indices. Next. Next, please. I also use grain seeker sensor to measure the canopy of the vegetation from each plot. The NDV uses a built in software that directly calculate the NDV value using the formula the near infrared minus red divided by the near infrared plus red. The data, data was collected on plant height by taking the measurement from the top soil to the topmost canopy using tape measure. Next. I also took take data on lateral branching from three randomly selected plants from each plot using tip measure. Fresh and dried biomass above ground level were weighed from three randomly selected plants in each plot using an electronic stroke. 
scale. The data obtained was analyzed using Arrow Statistical Software version 4.0.2. Next. And so the results from the data analyzed give significant difference between dry folder width, fresh folder width, height at port musician, lateral branching at port musician, and DVI at port musician. However, there was no any significant difference between green area at port musician and green area at port musician, and which is no surprise to me in the sense that at that time, the plants were not under stress. And so I was not expecting differences between the green area and the green area. Next. Uh, moreover, please let me explain something more on that table. If you can go back one slide for me. Uh, when we look at this table, the first line, ICGV-1S08837, recorded the highest dry folder width, also recorded the highest fresh folder width, recorded the highest height, highest lateral branching, and also recorded the highest NDVI value. When you compare that with, with ICG, which is the fourth, 15033, it had a smaller dry folder width as compared to the 0887. Half the fresh folder width also is smaller and also had a smaller NDVI as compared to the NDVI of the 08837. And so, as the folder increase as height increase as lateral branching increases, the NDVI value also increases. You can go to the next slide. And so, generally, typically, there were significant differences. What does it imply? Uh, so, we ran a correlation analysis between these parameters to see the implication of the, gen the genotypic results. And so, the upper part of the table represent the correlation coefficients and the lower part represent the p values so looking at the data there is high correlation between fresh folder weight and dry folder weight with a correlation coefficient of 0 0.98 and between ndvi and and lateral branching, it was also, there was also a significant correlation. And so, but when you compare height and NDVI, there wasn't much, there wasn't significant difference. And that is because the more branch the plants are, they're able to intercept the light that is thrown using the NDVI or using the green seeker. And so what this tells us is that, especially with the correlation between the folder, fresh folder width and the dry folder width, it means if you are working on genotypes that are large, where you want to take folder, dry folder width, and maybe due to limitation of time and space or resources, you can take the fresh folder from the field because there's a strong correlation between the fresh and the dried one. And so, you can take the fresh from the field, which may be able to serve the same purpose. And also, because there's also correlation between NDVI and, and lateral branching, and also with, with fresh folder weeds, it implies that you can use the green seeker to determine biomass weight without necessarily have to do in but we don't necessarily have to do the strategy sampling. Next. And so for object, uh, to determine objective two, an experiment was established using 192 genotypes of short duration. 
this. So the assignment was arranged in a lattice design with three replications. Each plot contained one row of two meters long, with a spacing of 0 0.5 meters between rows and 0 0.2 meters between plants. A meter alley was used to separate replicas. Next. So, so far, I've collected data on this to first flower appearance, seedling vigor, this to 50% flowering, plant height, lateral branching, relative chlorophyll content, disease incidence, early leaf spots, late leaf spots, specific leaf area, normalized vegetation in this green area and green green area of vegetation and canopy temperature. This data, as we speak, is undergoing processing. Next. And so the activities that are ahead, data will continue to be collected on the first experiment and the experiment which contains the 192 genotypes. And also during the drought, dry season, which starts in Ghana, October, we'll conduct a trial which will help us to evaluate how these 192 genotypes will fare when it's coming to drought. And also, I am drafting my thesis. Yes. And these are some few references. Yes. The challenges so far encountered due to COVID-19, there was late arrival of the planting materials and also at times faces poor network. Yes. And this work is possible through the support of my supervisors, Professor Kajo Furin, Dr. Ajima Dankwa, Dr. Richard Otin Frimpong, Dr. Maria Balota, and fellow student colleague Jeff Zakari Anindu, and the technician and CSR in the person of Baba Yusuf Kassin. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Very nice presentation. Lots of, of good, good work going on. Uh, the floor is now open for any questions or, or comments. I had, had one for you, Emmanuel. The 192 lines that you're now evaluating under the field, do those also include the 10 training lines and do they include the current released varieties in Ghana? Yes, please. But they are, uh, the 10 genotypes are not included. The 10 genotypes will be used at training populations. And so the plan is to use, to validate, to validate that on the 192. So the 10 are not parts of the 192. Okay. And these are all being planted on the, the Sari station in Young Palace. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. Any other questions? Let's see. We have a question from David Okello to uh, wanting to know how early is short duration? And can you Give any oh, kind so of thought on on how you would determine escapes from drought versus tolerance to drought. Let's see if you can repeat the second part of the question for me. The question is, you know, if you go with early varieties, oftentimes they just escape drought that occurs late in the season. So how would you determine the difference between just escaping drought versus actually tolerating drought? All right, thank you. So with the first um, part of the question, so far in literature, what I have found concerning short duration is those which are able to reach physiological maturity at 90 days after planting. And for the drought experiment, we are going to use a split plot when we have two main water regimes. Well, the water region will be the main plot with the genotypes being subplots. And so we'll stress 
one and one will not be stressed. And so at the end of the day, the data we take will be able to help us know which ones are resistant or tolerant rather. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments for Emmanuel? Okay, well, Emmanuel, thank you very much for an excellent presentation and, and good luck with the trials this year. We look forward to seeing the results here. Uh, Very much. Thanks very much. So we'll now move on to our, our next presenter, who is Anikoi Mariyama, who is a PhD student working with ICRASAT in Niger as well. Good evening. Our work at the of developing a plastic resistant peanut using silicon biochemical matter. Next. Next. The objective of our project is to identify specific biochemical responsible for air plastic resistance in silicon and the developing of uh, biochemical matter. Identification of silicon mediated air plastic resistance line by field and uh, IVSC testing to develop a flavic resistant line for field deployment in target country. Our third relate to objective three of the project titled assessment of granite genotype for response to drought, phosphorus deficiencies and aflatoxin contamination for improving productivity in Sahelian zone. Next. Next slide. Granite is the important legume crop of tropical and semi-tropical countries, where it provides a major source of edible oil and vegetable protein. Uh, the many limiting factors in this region are drought and aflatoxin contamination. Also, a production contamination is the major risk in many granite production countries. Semi-arid and arid conditions linked to contamination and the poor subsist of frequently contaminated steppes. Recent studies in Niger demonstrated that drought for less than 10 days was enough to cause significant aflatoxin contamination in the field. The aflatoxin contamination is often related to the intensity of drought stress, the stage when drought stress occurs, and the soil and air temperature. Terminal drought Contamination is well documented. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, to mitigate this major contract of granular production, it is very important to identify the threat associated with improving on how and contamination to accelerate the development of genotype resilient to this of this study 
is to assess anti genotype for brown tolerance and apply toxin resistance on the lazy matter and field condition. As objective, especially if we have the aflatoxin build up can offer due to genotypic defects and to identify in the field and the control condition the measurable traits related to tolerance to water deficit and the contamination, leading to accelerate the development of genotypes more resilient to this control. To achieve this objective, following materials and the method were used. Slide. Next slide. Okay. The experiment was in the International Crop Research Institute for Semi Arid Tropics, Sadore, during the rainy season. 2019 on the lazy system. The lazy system is a PVP cylinder tube, a placid upright in one meter deep trench. A 14 genotypes were as assessed. We have new improvements and the varieties that a genotype a largely developed in. The experimental design was a randomized complex block design with four replications, 14 genotypes, and two water rings, W, water, uh, water and WS. It is an intermittent water deficit. Next slide. Uh, data collection of the depth of the emergency. We uh, were recorded. We also determined the transpiration efficiency, the canopy temperature index by using infrared uh, camera, the canopy temperature decreasing, the water extraction. We determined also the lift area, a specific lift area, a number of food by foot, food weight by foot. Number seed by two, seed weight by two. The data collection was subjected to ANOVA by using gen start uh, uh, 17th edition. Next slide. This figure shows the variation of the lift area meter on the water regime, water regime, WW and WS. Uh, the ANOVA uh, reveals a significant variation of a, a genetic variation effect of water regime. So the intermittent water is stress. Uh, uh, reduce the specific lift, uh, lift area up to 45%. These three genotypes uh, recorded the, the high lift area on the WS condition. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. The figure to show the home variation on the bottom water is stress. Here also the water is stress reduces the home up to up to seventeen percent. These three genotypes recording the higher volume on the WS and W and the W than uh, 55, uh, 47, which is the, the check resistance to aflatoxin. Next slide.
The figure three shows the variation of uh, the food weight variation on the bottle water regime. Here also, uh, the intermittent drought reduced the food weight up, up to 86%. On the WS condition, 12 CS116 clear 11 and ICGEN 11 one two night have the highest weight. Next slide. Uh, the figure for sure the variation of uh, seed weight on the bot uh, water regime. Uh, the important re reduction due to intermittent drought is uh, 84 percent. Uh, the three genotypes highlighted show the, the, the highest seed weight on the WS and the WW condition. Next slide. And according to this result, the genotype ICG12991, ICG uh, 197YH3, and uh, LFMTS116 produce more food than the resistant sector. This genotype con can be con considered as aflatoxin resistant, not that these genotypes have also the highest uh, specific list area, so can do better photosynthesis. Uh, as Peter, what we have to assess granot genotype for intermittent drought tolerance under light metal condition in off season, assessment of granite genotype for intermittent and drought uh, and the terminal drought tolerance on the light meter and the field. Light meter tube will uh, use on the well irrigated intermittent and terminal drought condition. Data taken is being analyzed and the analyzer, uh, ELISA test will be used to assess the, the level of toxin contamination. Next slide. Thank you all to listen to me. This figure show also the lively metric system with uh, granite plant in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anikoy, very nice presentation. We did have one question already from Zariah. I don't know whether you can see the chat and want to read it. Uh, it's regarding what genotypes have you found that had the least reduction of pod and seed weight under drought? And how can you correlate seed production and aflatoxin resistance. How can you correlate seed production? Hello, Mariama. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear to you. Okay. Uh, please, Jeb, I just want to translate the question in French so she can reply. All right. You can you follow. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, Ilya, uh, Ilya, that sound Ilya. is bad. I think it is better to, to, to write the question. No, it's better to traduire la question. Tu vas répondre maintenant en anglais pour elle. The sound is bad. Tu m'entends pas? Mariama, tu m'entends pas? 
Je, je n'entends pas bien vraiment. Ok. Sinon, ils veulent, ils veulent moi, je t'entends bien. Ils, 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 quel est le génotype qui a présenté la FM? Ça coupe, même pour vous, ça coupe. Ça coupe. Ok. Ça coupe, même pour vous, je n'entends pas ça. Mais lis, elle a, regarde, va dans le truc chat là. Tu cliques là-bas. Regarde en bas de tes présentations, il y a chat. Tu cliques, tu vas voir la question en, en texte. Ok, go to chat. You will see uh, and, and on your screen, press pen, chat, share screen. You, you click on chat, you will see the question uh, from Soraya and uh, another one from uh, Elga. Tu as vu ça? Is she able to see the chat follow through? If not, we can we can move on and, and she can obviously provide a written reply to the questions as a follow-up. Mariama, so okay, if you cannot uh, see and reply to respond to uh, Soraya, yeah. we can yeah. we'll go forward. Yeah, I think yeah, Alalu and, and Heinekwa, I think yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll move on. I mean, we've got a couple of good questions from Soraya and Helga that you can discuss and, and provide answers to them. Okay. Later on, <clears throat> appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank and, you. And, uh, all the best for a really good uh, season coming up. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to move on now to our next presenter, who is Joseph Gomez, and uh, Joseph is a PhD student, and will be. Uh, presenting on the genetic improvement of resistance to early and late leaf spot in a, using a QTL interspecific back cross population. Joseph, we look forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you, uh, David. Good morning. I'm Joseph Gomis. PhD student supervised by Dr. Daniel Fonseca and Dr. Abu Bakri Khan. I'm Senegalese and I'm uh, from Sheikh Anta Job University of Dakar. My PhD project turned around use of uh, wild species for genetic improvement of cultivated peanut against early and late leaf spot. So that's my that's my first academic year, so this presentation will mainly focus on the context of the project, uh, the objective, and uh, some current activities. Next, please. Well, early and late list port are among major biotic stresses uh, that reduce peanut worldwide production. They are fungal diseases uh, caused respectively by Cercospora rachidicola and Cercosporidium personatum. They both cause uh, necrotic lesion on leaves, but lesion caused by Cercospora rachidicola are dark brown and surrounded by a yellow halo. And lesion caused by Cercosporidium personatum are dark, more circular and without a halo. In case of severe attacks, 
they can cause uh, yield losses uh, up to 50%. Next. So in developed countries, uh, use of fungicide can, can lead to control these diseases, but these products have negative impact on environment, on users' health, and can so increase the, the production cost. So the most effective solution against these diseases is the use of uh, resistant varieties. But as shown in several studies, there is a serious lack of uh, high level of resistance in cultivated germ plasma, particularly in uh, elite uh, varieties. Uh, in contrast, wild relatives of peanuts are found to be very resistant and can then be used to create uh, new cultivated varieties with a good level of, uh, of resistance. Next. So several, several wild uh, have already been identified as a potential donor of a gene of resistance to, to, to improve the cultivated varieties. But as related by Cleven Diaz and Al, Arakis carinaceae remains the mostly used wild species uh, to create a resistant line in several breeding program and in several places. So there is a real need to diversify sources of resistance in improved varieties to avoid any breakdown of uh, the resistance by pathogens and also to avoid any emergency of uh, new strain of uh, pathogens. Next. So our, our main objective is to contribute to this diversification by finding new wild allele of uh, resistance in a population involved as uh, parents, a new synthetic allotetraploid named IPACOR and obtain it uh, by crossing Arachis ipiensis and Arachis corentina. Three specific objectives have been defined in our study, they are identification of wild genomic region involved in resistance against these diseases uh, by QTL mapping, evaluation of the impact of uh, cercospora uh, leaf spot on nutritional quality of home by uh, protein content analysis, and at the end, analysis of variability of uh, uh, pathogen strain by morphological characterization. Next. So to, to achieve the first objective, uh, mapping population was developed at uh, Seras Greenhouse by crossing Ipacor and Flower 11. The F1 were identified uh, by genetic analysis and uh, cross it with flower 11 to obtain the, the BC1. These BC1 were in one hand uh, advanced by self-pollinization for four step of uh, consecutive self-pollinization to obtain the BC1 F5. And they were also uh, back cross it to flower 11 to obtain the BC2, BC2. And these BC2 were advanced uh, by self-pollinization poly, self at three times to obtain the BC2 F4. So our final population was constituted by uh, 230 genotypes. 108 BC1 F5 and 122 BC2 F4. Next. Uh, genotyping activities uh, in our population were, was initiated uh, by GNA extraction at uh, Seras. So young leaves of 25 day 
days after sowing were collected, dried uh, for three days, and a genomic DNA extraction was performed at uh, Sera's laboratory by with uh, Mata protocol. So the obtained DNA were purified and sent to our partners at uh, UGA for SNP analysis with Axiom Arakis. For phenotyping activities, uh, two years of uh, filed evaluation were planned for this rainy season and the next rainy season. It will mainly consist on an evaluation of resistance to early and late leaf spot, but uh, other parameters like uh, emergency, uh, flowering, seed and pot characteristic, and plant morphology will also be evaluated. Next. Uh, so for this rainy season, evaluation carried out at uh, Nyoro on July 6th. We decided to implement our assay at Nyoro because Nyoro is a hot spot and every year there is a good pressure of uh, diseases there. So we decided to implement our assay there. For this year, we, we, uh, 130 plants uh, have been in evaluation uh, in addition to flower 11 and two controls, CS16 as a resistant check and 12 CS48. There is, uh, there is a missing data here. It is uh, 12 CS48 as susceptible check. Our experimental design uh, is an alpha lattice with three repetition, and each repetition contains three band, and each in each three band, in each band we have three block of 17 genotypes. So evaluation of uh, uh, pa uh, parameters like uh, emergency and flowering have been already done. And in a couple of days, we will start evaluation for early leaf spot resistance. Uh, the data that we will obtain uh, for these above activities will allow us to perform uh, a QTL detection for resistance uh, against early and dead leaf spot. Next. Uh, the objective two will be an evaluation of protein content in Holm uh, under Cercospora leaf spot infection. Because of the uh, usefulness of these resources, particularly uh, for farmers in Africa, it is very important to evaluate damage caused by these pathogens on it. So to do it, we will identify most infected plants and most resistant. And after harvest, they will be dried and crushed. And uh, evaluation of protein content will be performed uh, on sample by NIPS technology at Seras. We will also perform a digestibility test on this sample uh, by spectrophotometry, also at Sarah's uh, biochemistry laboratory. Next. And in objective three, we will perform an, an analysis of variability of uh, uh, Cercospora strain by morphological characterization. Uh, so to do it, we will collect uh, uh, infected leaves and infected parts of these leaves will be cultivated in potato dexterous agar. And after spore identification, we will perform uh, morphological characterization to see if uh, they are the same strain or if they are a variability of strain. We will also use this board to, to perform a pathogenicity, pathogenicity test on data sheet, data sheet leaves. Next. Uh, so during uh, population development, we encountered uh, lethality and sterility. 
and lethality was at the origin of the reduction of population size. Uh, from the beginning to now, we have lost more than 50, 50 genotypes. And for sterility, sterility was at the origin of the reduction of the available number of plants to test this year. As shown in my presentation, uh, just 130 plants was available to be tested. The uh, other uh, 100 didn't have enough seed, enough seed and are in multiplication. We hope that next year they, they will be able to be, to be tested. Uh, we encountered uh, also some difficulty due to uh, COVID-19 pandemic like travel restriction, closure of university. And for meeting attended, I have participated uh, last year at the Peanut uh, Innovation Lab workshop at Senegal uh, and Peanut uh, Innovation Lab annual meeting online. And now I'm participating on uh, at a training of e-resources organized by, uh, organized by Itoka, Itoka uh, Next. Uh, so I'm, at, I'm done. Uh, I would like to thank any institution and any person who participate to the realization of this project. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joseph. We've had a, a couple of questions or comments that have uh, been submitted already. One from Soraya who, uh, who commented that don't worry about the sterility of seeds because as you probably already know, this is rather common when you are dealing with these intraspecific crosses. So, uh, that's something to be expected, but overall, you know, it, it's really exciting that you have such a large population to deal with. Helga wanted to know how, um, I mean, obviously it's going to take a lot of years to, to develop new varieties from this work. So if you have any comments on, on how that might happen would be appreciated, but also how are you involving women and men farmers uh, early on to look at uh, any evolving new varieties that would obviously you know, improve the impact of your work. I didn't, I didn't get uh, the question from Elga. Uh, uh, um, trying to translate it in French because my, I, I'm not very well at, at English, but I, I will, I, I think that I will be able to, to respond on chat. Okay. Is it, is it okay? That, that's okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions that people have for, for Joseph? One question, I, I'll put it on the chat too, is, is okay. have you, this, this, the genotyping, is that samples have already been sent to UGA? Yeah, the, the genotype, uh, yeah, the, the sample, the DNA sample uh, were sent to, to UGA, yes. <coughs> it's just the DNA. We, we have already extracted DNA and sample were, was, was sent, were sent. Okay, good. Mm. And that was the whole, <clears throat> was that the whole set of 230 or only the selected lines? Um, more than more than more than 200 to 213 because uh, we we perform GNA extraction before before harvest so 230 plant were at the file 
at this time at this uh, that time so we we did extraction for the whole genotype and that's so that were 260 uh, plant okay <clears throat> after, okay very good <clears throat> the harvest uh, some genotype didn't survive so we now we have uh, just to 230 okay okay very good Mm, thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions for Joseph? David Okello has, has his hand raised, I'm told. So David, if you'd like to turn on your microphone. There we go. Over to you, David. David, can you hear me? Yes, David, do you hear me now? Yes, I do now. Very good. Now. Nice to hear you. Yes, um, I feel that this study um, in WCA needs to uh, coordinate well and talk with the uh, the one being done in uh, Uganda, um, having ESA uh, diversity, because we are seeing a trend in that um, some of the materials, uh, which, for example, uh, they say it is resistant to leaf spot, both early and late, we see them succumb, for example, in our side here. Uh, this could point out to the presence of uh, probably, you know, other strains, uh, the pathogen, so the pathogen diversity study uh, the one done in WCA and the one done in ESA could actually help us so much. I only wished um, we could add on some weather parameter, for example, the soil and the ambient uh, uh, temperature and probably the, the rainfall situation. If we could add those one up and add it to um, the work being done in Soraya's lab, probably we could be able to ascertain whether we have you know, the pathogen diversity with us in Africa. And this would guide in the exchange of materials. And again, I would also want to ask my friend over there in Senegal, whether they see the dual occurrence of both the early and the late um, leaf spot. And if he sees them, which one is much more predominant? Because um, it seems in Eastern Africa, uh, the late leaf spot is much more predominant. And in the South, we see uh, the, the early one is predominant. But uh, when they come in here, for example, in uh, Uganda, we start seeing the early one in the first uh, uh, zero to six weeks, but anything after that, then uh, the virulence of the late leaf spot, you know, coalesces the lesion of the early one and what we score phenotypically, it appears as if it is late, but we know the early is masked in there. So I don't know if um, we could, the two projects could work together and we try to, uh, I mean, underscore this important stress. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. Yeah, very good good comments and, and I yeah I, I mean, regarding your first comment about correlating that's that's actually you know one of the reasons why we wanted to have these kinds of presentations so that uh, not only the students can can understand whether the students are doing in other parts of Africa the countries that we work in but as well the, the corresponding PIs and, and mentors can can look at these opportunities uh, because I agree I think that's uh, Hopefully, one of the values that the Innovation Lab can bring to these kinds of, of projects is, is the ability to to work with others doing similar work that might might not have been able to be done in the past. So I, I encourage you to, to talk to to Daniel and and uh, Joseph and and Soraya and, and others can can discuss how we could actually make that happen. I think as well. I mean, I, you know, yes. I hopefully Joseph can can and look at how you can score both early and late leaf spot. I don't know, Joseph, if you, you wanted to have any yeah. comments on that. Excuse me? Joseph, would you like to make any comments to, to David's? 
I, I, I just think that uh, this uh, work can be, uh, can be uh, linked to many other, like uh, Soraya works. Uh, our objective tree, uh, study of uh, variability of uh, circospora strength, uh, can exactly uh, open the pers perspective of uh, genetic study of diversity, uh, like uh, uh, Soraya is doing. And for his question, uh, what, what is the predominant form here at Senegal between early and late peace port. Last year we make uh, a tower in several parts of uh, Senegal and we we shown that early is most uh, most predominant. We, we, we have collected several infected leaves and sent them to Soria for Genetic, genetic uh, for analysis of genetic diversity. So I think that it will be very great to coordinate our our activities. So I think Daniel will Daniel will will think about it. Very good. Thanks a lot. Mm. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph, and and good luck with all your trials this year. Thank you. A lot of good work going on. So we'd like to now move on to our, our next presenter, um, Danielle Hassando, is a master's student at Monterey University. And she's going to be presenting on the performance of ground nut interspecific lines and identifying canid genes under with disease resistance under Uganda conditions. So we look forward to your presentation, Danielle. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Next slide. Okay, so my name is Daniela Meisando, and I'm presenting on the performance of granite interspecific lines and identification of candidate genes associated with disease resistance under Ugandan conditions. I'm being supervised by Dr. Soraya Betioli, Dr. Thomas Odong, and Dr. Kalule Okelo David. Next slide. So well, the previous slide, thank you. So granite is one of the most important leguminous crops in, in Uganda after beans. However, its production is hindered by several abiotic and biotic factors, amongst which we have late leaf spot and granite rosette diseases. Um, late leaf spot causes about 60% yield losses annually, and granite rosette causes about 100% yield losses also annually. So you could actually see from figure one, the effect of GRD on the yield losses, especially before flowering. So resistance to GRD and late leaf spots are therefore required um, traits in high yielding background when we introduce new varieties into the country. So over the years, the granite breeding program in Uganda has developed varieties that combine resistance to GRD and late leaf spots with good yields. You find such as um, the Serenat series. Next slide. So the polygenic nature of the diseases makes the identification of resistant and susceptible lines quite cumbersome through conventional screening techniques. So from the previous slide, you know that the granite, cultivated granite has a narrow genetic base. So its species origin and continuous selfing reduces the allelic combinations for disease and pest resistance. So wild species have been used in so many crops to widen the genetic base of their cultivated species, such as chickpea, soya bean, and common bean. So the Uganda breeding program have received some interspecific lines, the advanced back cross QTL and chromosome segment substitution lines that were obtained from Senegal. And um, these lines introduce genetic variation from wild species pool from four different wild species. And we could actually evaluate these lines and they could be used as parents in our Crosses to improve existing varieties. Next slide. So my objective is to improve granite production in Uganda by increasing the potential of cultivated genotypes. Specifically, I seek to evaluate these lines for 
um, the agronomic trade in Uganda, and also determine their response to both GRD and late leaf spot. So I hypothesize that these lines are diverse for important agronomic trade due to their wild background, and also um, show variation for late leaf spot and GRD due to their wild background. Next slide. So I had um, 376 lines, and the lines have been broken down here. These lines were obtained from Senegal, as I said, and I had four checks, um, three from Uganda, the dogs, and Serenat, and flare from Senegal. So these lines were evaluated um, for two seasons in two locations. Um, I evaluated them using an alpha lattice of 20 blocks and 19 plots and two reps. Yes, please, next slide. So this is just an overview of what, this is just a table showing some of the agronomic traits I collected. So I decided to show the yield traits. So um, you find that a lot of them were significant, especially for the, the genotype. But and when you come to environment um, interaction with genotype, it was only average number of pods. Um, one of the locations I evaluated in had a very high disease pressure. I evaluated these lines in two hotspots of GRD and late leaf spots. And one of them, Nakabango, had a very high disease pressure in 2019B as compared to um, Serere. Please, next slide. So to just summarize some of the results I had, I used the principal component analysis. I decided to divide my lines so that it would make it easy to visualize. But then you find that some of these lines, especially the CSSL lines, did well. And the correlations were quite different from the ABQTL lines derived from AVALIDA and AGRNSs would have comprehensive um, data from this season and would also confirm this correlation. But in all, some of these lines did quite well done, even the dogs and the flare 11. And next slide. So this is just, um, these are two histograms showing the same thing. But then for figure five, these were, the, this is just for grain yield, but for figure five, this was under disease conditions and figure six was under controlled conditions. I, during the multiplication, I took quite a lot of traits. So I just wanted to show the, the two instances. So you realize that from figure five, um, that's why the fact that these lines were resistant to GRD and late leaf spots. There's 12, the CS lines still outweighed some of the lines we have. And still for figure six, you see that um, the CS lines and some of the interspecific lines did way better than the lines that we have. Next slide. So this is also for some of the agronomic traits. So I, the shelling percentage was calculated as the, um, the weight of um, seeds in 100 pods divided by the 100 pod weight times 100. So you find that um, the lines from some of the, the interspecific lines, I couldn't represent them all, but they did quite well. Then even the dog IR, the shelling percentage also further tells you about the ease of shelling. For instance, if you use the mechanized um, system to shell your seeds, you would want a very high shelling percentage. But if you go by hand, you'd want to be, have the ease of shelling. Um, you want to find, um, you find it easier to shell when it has a lower shelling percentage. And so for figure eight, this is just to a distribution for the 100 seed weight. The 100 seed weight tells us about the confectionary potential. And again, you find that the lines, the interspecific lines did way better than our adapted varieties. Next slide. So this is just for, so as I said, I evaluated these lines for their resistance to late leaf spot. And Serenat series, as usual, did very well for late leaf spots. But then you find that some of the lines also did quite well and even better than our adapted varieties, which would have to very much look into it and determine if it was from the 
wild species or just by the environment. Next slide. So, so again, to make, to prevent decongestion, I divided the lines again. So you find that from this principal component, this is just for the chromosome segment substitution lines. Um, they, some of the lines that were resistant to GRD as opposed to the flare. And um, I think MCS075 and 065 were showed some where resistance to GRD with, um, I think um, they were between the range of 12 to 16. So the PDI is cal calculated as the number of infected pods, number of infected plants divided by the total number of plants in a plot. So I'm waiting to collect my severity scores next week and it would be a very, instead of using the PDI, the severity scores would be a very good uh, measure to do this again. Next slide. So the same thing here. Um, these are the lines from A. Valida and A. Juranensis. So you find that same here, a lot of the lines were quite resistant to GRD with the same um, range. Yes. Next slide. I'm supposed to identify some QTLs for disease resistance and also some interesting agronomic traits. So from the previous slides, we identified that the CS lines under disease conditions gave very high, well, gave high number of pods, pods as compared to our um, elite varieties. So with the help of my supervisor, Dr. Soraya, we, she, I helped me identify some of these regions. So we could actually stack resistances and yield traits into the background of our local varieties. Next slide, please. So, so far I've evaluated all the lines in two locations, Nakabango and Serere, for two seasons. I'm left to evaluate these lines for LLS and GRD at harvest and collect those data. So far, I have found about four of the lines, four of the interspecific, interspecific lines were resistant to GRD and 63 were moderately resistant. And 2% of these lines were also resistant to LLS. So from the previous slide, we find um, some of the QTLs have been identified for some of the yield related traits and which would also help in selection. We are left to identify some of the candidate genes for GRD resistance, lately sports resistance, and some significant agronomic trait. That's after this um, season's evaluation. Next slide. So generally, the COVID measures have made uh, it difficult to complete field tasks, social distancing on the field, and also transport is quite difficult and expensive. We also are, we are also challenged with high cost of internet for online meetings. Next slide. So I'd like to thank the following organizations for all the help they've rendered to me and also to my supervisors and also my fellow colleagues who have helped me so far. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Very nice presentation. I think the floor is now open for, we have plenty of time for some questions. Uh, we have one question from Isaac Mende, and he would like to know, based on your experience, what do you think is more serious, early or late leaf spot? Okay, I personally, I think, um, Late leaf spot is more serious due to the complete defoliation of the leaves. The effect of it is complete um, defoliation of the leaves, which causes a, an effect on total yield. Okay. Other questions? I was interested, um, uh, Danielle, in knowing You've, you've identified certain lines that are that have 
good resistance to GRD, some to LLS, some to uh, yield. Are any of these lines in common? Or how would you actually, how would you advise the breeding programs like David's program there in Uganda to actually utilize these lines uh, to develop new varieties? Okay, so interestingly, um, I, none of them were common. But then um, from our germplasm list, we, we find that um, we have very good lines that are resistant to LLS and GRD, but then have low yield, um, for instance, the number of ports are low, um, and some of them have bad shelling percentage. So we could actually incorporate, we could actually select the best lines, especially for the yield traits, and, um, and cross it with our local variety so that they could at least be high yielding and also be resistant to late leaf spot and GRD. Okay, um, so I wanted to kind of know uh, what, when is your next crossing season? Uh, kind of related to that, how, you know, how quick could you try to start stacking these traits together? I think immediately after the final evaluation, after I've taken the final data and run the analysis, I, it, it could easily be done. Okay. I was also curious, you mentioned, you mentioned shelling percentage and the differences between shelling lines mechanically versus by hand. How did you determine the shelling percentage or how do you do that? Okay, so for the shelling percentage, I weigh 100 seeds. I select them randomly. I weigh 100 seeds and I shell them. You, you shell them, then you weigh the, the amount of seeds you get from the hundred and the, the pot, and you divide that by the hundred seed weight, and you multiply that by hundred to determine the shelling percentage. So you're shelling by hand, is that true? Yes, if, especially when the, the things are very little. Okay. So it's a hand shelling percentage. Yes. You don't do a, a corresponding mechanical shelling percentage to see if there is a difference, as you say. Strength um, of the pod probably has a, would, would have some effect on that as well. Yes. Okay. Helga asked a question as well about, uh, you know, uh, when could you potentially involve farmers in selecting these lines. Uh, it may be a little bit too early to, to look at them, but I was just wondering, yeah, do you have any, any plans or any, any options that opportunities that would allow uh, local farmers to look at some of these materials, particularly ones that have good resistance to see if, if um, they see any desirable characteristics in them? Um, I think it's pretty early, but then I would I'll consult Dr. Kalule David to see how best we could we could do that. Okay. I mean, I know there are always field trial, you know, field days. Uh, hopefully, those will still be able to be conducted to some degree, and and uh, you know, sometimes it would be interesting, particularly with the the wild species and integration lines, to 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 kind of get some of their perspective whether they can can actually see. Uh, these traits and, and, you know, what their comments might be, feedback might be. Yes, yes, that would be great. Uh, Isaac was, was asking a follow-up question on the selling, shelling percentage. Uh, do you just take one sample per, per line or do you do multiple samples to get an average shelling percentage? I did have multiple samples. Um, Okay. I had two replications for each replications in two locations. So that's like, um, you know, generally like two replications for each location. So you'd have about four, okay, four reps in all. And I found the average. So it's, it wasn't just for one sample, like one plot or something. Okay, good. Yeah, that was good. Any other questions or comments for Danielle?
Okay, well, I don't see any. Um, so thank you very, very much for an excellent presentation and, and good luck with uh, the remaining field work. And uh, we look forward to seeing the results of all this great uh, research that you've been doing. Thank you. Thank so now I'd like to um, move on to our, our last presenter uh, this morning. I think I said that there were going to be eight, but actually there were going to be only seven presenting this morning. So our last presenter is, is Jopet Nindal, who is an MSc student at KNUST uh, in uh, Kumasi, Ghana. And Jopet is going to be speaking about the genetic variation of, of drought tolerance and oil quality traits in a, in a ground nut population using remote sensing. Jopet, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon from Ghana. Uh, I'm, I'm leading us to discuss on genetic variation for drought tolerance and oil quality trees in ground nut population using remote sensing technologies. My name is Japhet Nindu, and my supervisors are Pro, uh, Professor Richard Agroma, Dr. Richard Oteng Frempo, and Dr. Alexander Wirekukina from KNUST. Next, please. The order of my presentation is introduction, problem statement, justification, objectives, materials and method, and observations to be recorded. Next, please. Granite is mostly cultivated in the semi-arid climatic zones in the world. This situation is not different in Ghana, where over 90% of our granite production occurs in the Guinea savanna, Guinea and the Sudan savanna agroecological zones. These regions are characterized by an erratic rainfall condition which occasionally exposes the groundnut crop to early, mid or end season drought. But this mid or end season drought are deemed more critical as they affect the quality and the quantity of our groundnut produced. Another constraint to groundnut production in Ghana is disease incidence, particularly the early and the late leaf spot disease. Both early and late leaf spot disease are widely distributed and occurs in epidemic pro proportions. In Northern Ghana, in Northern Ghana, early and leaf, leaf spot can cause complete defoliation, which drastically can reduce yield. Moreover, the quality and the quality of the groundnut oil depends on its chemical properties, especially the fatty acid composition. Uh, oils rich in monounsaturated fatty acids have health benefits and enrich oil quality. Next, please. So, uh, to, to, to the, 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 the resistant, disease resistance are the safest and the most practical way to control disease in many crops. Therefore, we are developing a, a genotypes that are resistant to leaf spot and that can tolerate drought and can produce oil in high quality. Next, please. Despite its many benefits, yield on farmers' fields across the country has been low. And therefore, the local producers in the regions are not being able to meet the demands of groundnuts in the country. These losses that are due to drought can be attributed to high percentage defoliation from the leaf spot and inadequate soil moisture from drought, which affect the pot filling and subsequent grain yield. And the oil quality that is produced, oil quality has not been a major a trade that has been emphasized on. Therefore, the quality of oil produced has been poor. Next, please. So, so, so there is the need to develop varieties that is tolerant to drought, that is resistant to leaf spot, and that can produce oil in high quality to meet the demand of the markets in the country. Next, please. 
The objectives of this study is to assess the performance of populations segregating for drought and the rain-fed conditions, and to determine the oil composition of a segregation, segregating population, and also to estimate the components of genetic variation within the population. Next, please. In this experiment, field trials has been established with 94 genotypes from an F5 population. This population is from a cross of a genotype 55 to 473, and then the skew The 55 to 473 genotypes is a drought tolerant genotype from Senegal, and the skew is a high yielding, high oleic, and early maturing Spanish type groundnut from Texas, USA. Next, please. The experiment was laid in an augmented block design. It consisted of 18 blocks. The plus, the plus size, in the, with the plus size, we had two rows of groundnut planted per plot with a length of 10 centimeters within rows and a spacing of 20 centimeters between rows. We had a, a basal fertilizer application of 125 kilogram uh, triple superface phosphate per hectare. And then weeding was done on the uh, 15th to 20th day after sowing. And any time when weeding is necessary, when there's weeds on the field. Next, please. Observations to be recorded are days to emergence, days to first flower. That's the days to when uh, the first flower in the plot is observed days to 50% flowering. That is days to when 50% of the plot has flowers. Plant height at pegging. We will measure spot readings, chlorophyll, chlorophyll inflorescence. We'll take NDVI measurements. Next, please. And then we'll score for early leaf spot at 70 days after emergence and then leave leaf spot at 85 days after emergence. We will score for rosette incidence at eight weeks after emergence, and then rosette incidence at 12 weeks after emergence. We will measure days to maturity, dry weight of homes per plot in kilograms, dry weight of pores per plot in kilograms, and then the oil composition. Next, please. We will be using green seeker, photosync, and spot chromator to help in the uh, recording of our observations. Next, please. The plant activities are observations that we are recording right now will be analyzed using our statistical software. And this experiment has been laid in two fields. One is protected from leaf spot and the other as control, which is not protected. And the resistance to leaf spot will be estimated on the unprotected field. The experiment will be repeated in an irrigation site in the experimental uh, site of Sari under controlled moisture. Next, please. And this is what I have done so far. The following observations has been recorded. Days to emergence, days to first flower, days to 50% flowering. We have taken spot readings, chlorophyll inflorescence. We've taken the NDVI measurements and then the plant height at pegging. But no analysis has been done on the data yet because we are busy right now taking the data. Next, please. And the challenges we faced was low seed viability. This was due uh, to the delay of the materials as a result of the COVID. 
and then because of the delay because of the low seed viability we had low plant stand and that's the challenge we have faced so far next please and i want to uh, acknowledge uh, the help of my supervisors and my colleague students my supervisor dr richard Oteng Frimpo, Dr. Doris Kavina, uh, Mr. Kasim Baba Yusuf, and a colleague student, Mr. Emmanuel Kofisi, and Mrs. Linda Kofi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jopeth. And uh, the floor is open for comments. We've had a couple of uh, questions submitted on the chat. Uh, the first one comes from, from Helga, who um, wanted to know a little bit more about uh, the potential for oil markets in Ghana and, you know, are there processing plants? Um, how do they interact with farmers? So just wondering the importance of oil composition. Don't know whether you have that answer or not, but if, if not, you might want to think about it uh, as part of your, your research, at least the introduction to, to the traits. But maybe you, you have some ideas. Okay. In, in Ghana here, the market on oil has been very high. We, we have uh, granite mills here that shell the granite, and there are women in the market that are ready uh, to process these granules to obtain this oil. So there is much emphasis that has been placed on oil from granules in the country. All right, good. Um, Isaac uh, wanted to know, your, your project obviously focuses both on drought tolerance and on oil quality. And he was wanting to know what, what do you see as the balance between those two traits? Uh, are you more focused and interested in drought or more in oil? Uh, are they kind of two separate traits that you're analyzing or do you see any potential to, to for overlap between those two traits? Uh, more of our emphasis is on drought because these genotypes we are using is from a cross between a drought tolerant variety. So we are much emphasized on the drought. But we are measuring, we are taking oil quality in addition to the drought and then leaf spot to uh, resistance. Okay. Uh, Maria would like to know um, how do you plan to determine oil quality? To determine this oil quality, uh, with my my uh, research supervisor, we will be sending uh, the materials out for for uh, analysis, so that we'll be able to determine the composition of uh, fatty acids in the oil. You say out? Is that some? Is that a laboratory in Ghana, or is it going to have to be sent no. somewhere outside of Ghana? Uh, we are sending it out outside Ghana. But I will have to talk more with my project supervisor so that I will have more information on that. Okay. Do you know if there are laboratories in Ghana that can do the oil analysis? Mm, I don't know of any laboratory in Ghana. So my project supervisor suggested that we will be taking it outside the country so okay. that we can have a good uh, distance out. All right. Uh, Mark Pearl just commented that Richard should have a, a refractometer. So that is one possibility for testing the, the quality of oil. So obviously. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, we had a question from uh, from Austin Stone, who is is uh, a student working with us uh, on a lot of GIS uh, analyses, and uh, 
wanted to just make a comment that, uh, you know, as you begin finding relationships between spectral properties and oil quality, et cetera, you know, uh, there might be some very interesting opportunities to, to use satellite data uh, for incorporating in more of a regional analysis, et cetera. And so uh, as, as you, you know, we're, we're putting a lot more emphasis on, you know, acquiring the GIS location of fields and, and, and data because there is a lot now that can be done, particularly if you start combining it with remote sensing and, and satellite information. So I, I might put you and, and Austin in contact and you can discuss a little bit more about what those opportunities might be. Okay. I guess Isaac made a comment that, that it, it's a bit strange that, that it would be necessary to, to determine the quality of oil and groundnut outside of Ghana, uh, particularly if, if it's a high value and assuming that oil quality would be one of those aspects that would determine the value. But uh, definitely something that might be needed to be looked into for sure. And particularly uh, as you're moving to, you know, the new sorry nut uh, IOA variety, I, I don't know the status of, of of, of that variety yet in terms of being released. I know that it's, it's I think, been approved for release, but uh, definitely being able to determine the, you know, that it's a higher lake and maintaining that as a higher lake through the value chain would be quite important. Other questions for Japheth? comments. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jopit, for an excellent presentation and, and all the best and good luck for finishing all the trials this year. So that uh, concludes our presentations for today's session of, of, of graduate students. I think I uh, want to thank all the students for an excellent set of presentations and particularly for all the exciting work that they're, they're doing uh, as part of their research and their thesis. Um, it's, I think, the, as I've said several times, I think the Having students as part of our, our projects are, are extremely important, but I think as well keeps us all on our toes and, and provides a lot of exciting ideas and, and uh, efforts that uh, really help improve the overall uh, outputs of, of everything that we do. So it's always good that, uh, to see the excellent work that they're doing, how committed they are. Uh, it's definitely challenging times. It's always challenging times to to do agricultural research and field work. Uh, you never know what's going to hit you, you know, from, from weather-wise, et cetera, but uh, adding on top of that, uh, the COVID-19 situations in, in almost all of our countries uh, just creates an added challenge. And, and I, I know we're very appreciative of, of all the efforts that all the students are continue to do uh, and to figure out new ways of working uh, new ways of getting the job done and, and uh, never giving up hope uh, to, to keep going forward. So we greatly appreciate that and, and we're working as hard as we can to try to figure out solutions uh, to the problems and making sure that one, they can continue to do the work in the field that they need to and, and ultimately can complete their degrees. So uh, I think together we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, Thank everybody else, all the participants. I think we've had a really good uh, number of people listening in, including uh, a lot of the other fellow graduate students. We've, we've emphasized to them that uh, uh, you know, our hope is that they won't just show up and present and then go away, uh, that, that these are 
important opportunities for them to hear what other students are doing and to obviously identify students that they like to contact uh, and talk about their research and how it might uh, help their own research projects. And I think we've already heard of several examples where that could happen and we, we encourage that uh, as well. We, we also think that, you know, this is the new uh, cadre of, of scientists moving forward and, and uh, creating that community of practice and, and community of, of students together is, is something that we've all experienced in our own uh, degree programs. And, and I think it's uh, an important part of, of creating a, a research community. So we hope that uh, this is a, a good start to that and, and uh, we'll look at ways in which we can continue to encourage that. So that ends our, our presentations for today. Thanks everyone. Um.